Let's take a flight with the angels. Coming up next right here on The Right Stuff. Hi, and welcome to The Right Stuff. I'm the queen, Parker J. Thanks so much for joining me. Today, we're going to be talking to a father-son writing duo, Alan and Aaron Rainey. They are the author of the book, Flight of the Angels. It's available on Amazon.com or wherever books are sold. So go ahead, love on my brothers, and get your copy of this wonderful book today. You're not going to be disappointed. I started reading this book, and let me tell you, dear listener, you are going to love it. It's sci-fi, it's rich in wonderful world building, some interesting characters, and more. But before I do that, I want you to get to know Alan and Aaron in just a few moments. As always, I want to thank our Patreon team for their support. We've been showcasing Christian authors for 10 years. As God gives us grace, we'll continue to do so. If you want to help out, go to patreon.com slash write stuff. To stay up to date with PJC Media, go to pjcmedia.net. Click that pink follow button. You'll never miss a show. Subscribe to our YouTube channel for updates, uploads, and more. Go ahead, subscribe today. Lastly, I want to thank you all for your support of my newest release called A Chance of Idoa. It's the last book of the Last Chance Bride series. I can't wait to get your response. Go ahead, get it exclusively on Amazon.com. And so without further ado, I'm going to bring Alan and Aaron on board. Alan and Aaron, how you doing today? Very well. Thank you, Archer. Yep. Thank you. I am so glad that you took time out of your schedule to be here with me today. And I got to tell you, dear listener... Alan and Aaron and I have all worked together, but this is the first time we're actually talking. And we work together because we just had a wonderful new release I can't wait to tell you about. I'm not going to tell you about it right now because we're going to focus on Alan and Aaron. But dear listener, I cannot wait to tell you about this exciting project we were all a part of. But hold your horses, we'll get to it. Now, Alan and Aaron, what's it like to be a father-son duo working together? Because I would think Aaron that as soon as you hit 18, you were kicking the door out your mom and dad's house, trying to get away as soon as possible, and yet you choose to have a writing career with your dad. Yeah, uh, funny how that works out. It's interesting you mentioned being 18 years old because I'll say it was likely right around that time when the germ of the idea for Flight of the Angels started. I'll never forget, it was me and my siblings, I've got two younger brothers and a younger sister, we were all hanging out in the living room, and my dad comes out of the bedroom with a yellow notepad. And this was not common. I I mean, we grew up in a household that loved books. My dad read to us every night. We loved discussing literature, but but it wasn't very common to see him um, write something like this of his own. But he seemed so excited to share with us what he had been cooking in his mind. And so he starts to read Uh, this little snippet that he had scrawled on this notepad. And it was set in this dark, futuristic world. There was this man terrified running from this pursuer, and it caught up with him, and it started to interrogate this man about his faith. And at the end, uh, it resulted in this man being executed. And it was so horrific, but evocative and interesting. And I could right away imagine this world that he had created in just this brief little scene. Well, it turns out that scene that he had handwritten uh, 20, 30 years ago at this point ended up being the prologue uh, for Flight of the Angels. But um, it didn't immediately turn into that. Uh, It sat idle for, I want to say, a good six, eight years or so. I went away to college, quite frankly, forgot all about it until my dad reached out to me, I think kind of out of the blue, uh, when I was away at college and said, hey, remember that 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 scene uh, that I shared? And I, I vaguely did at the time, but I, he, he mentioned that he was interested in um, developing that into a full-blown novel, but I uh, was looking for some help. And I, uh, I went to college to be an English major, was pursuing some creative writing on my own, and it sounded like an interesting project. And from that point forward, uh, we started this uh, collaborative team. Yeah, for me... It was exactly what Aaron said happened, Uh, and he was away at college, and for some reason I really felt led to flesh out this 
universe that that little scene was based on kind of had not even close to a fully realized universe, but it had some key points in a, the first storyline that I really felt the story had to get to these certain key points. But it did not take me very long to realize that I wouldn't do justice to this story given my own limited skill level. Uh, I always was told by high school and college teachers that I was a decent writer, but I also knew that I had a son in college who was an English major, and I had been told by his instructors during teacher conferences and everything that he was a facile writer, that he could just, he knew how to you know, get the thoughts onto the paper in a way that the reader would understand and find engaging. And so when I realized that I had bitten off a little bit more than I could chew to write a full length novel, that's when I got a hold of Aaron and it's like, please, please, please just say yes. I don't need you to do the whole thing. I just need you to collaborate. And and he said yes. And that started the process of us learning how to write together, which is a whole nother deal. And, and I'll just add to that, uh, being maybe overly gracious, uh, <laughs> my dad is a fantastic writer. And I mentioned that we're a team. Uh, I truly believe it's a complementary team in that he writes so, and he can produce. He writes so fast. He can just produce, you know, pages and pages of material where it can take me sometimes literally months to produce a single chapter because to a fault, I'm very meticulous and self-critical. And my dad, on the other hand, gets these ideas out and they're in really good condition. And he's so skilled at character work and dialogue, whereas I find my strengths tend to be maybe big picture, structural, connective tissue, and then maybe some of the fine tuning. So in that regard, uh, we tend to work really well as a team. So obviously there is a foundation between yourself and your son, Alan, about building a house on the rock and not on the sand. Because not only did you read to your sons and your daughters, you engaged with them. However, as the parent, how has your relationship evolved working with your son on equal footing as opposed to being the leader of your home when Aaron was a child? Oh, that's that's such a great question. I mean, it when my wife Becky and I, when we were raising our four children, we of course we were in charge and they knew that we were in charge. But of course, we also they also knew that our home and I think Aaron would back this up was an extremely safe place. It was a safe place where they could come home from school and know that they were cared for and loved no matter what happened at school. But also in addition to that, it kind of became a safe place for them to have their own marketplace of ideas as far as a little bit of pushback and some good interplay. In other words, uh, to kind of cut to the chase here, we realized pretty early on that we had raised four rather uh, outspoken, sarcastic children who would make uh, snarky jokes right back oh, at nice. us if something wasn't right. And so it I really believe that on top of this foundation of faith that you mentioned, which was primary, a foundation of faith and love for the written word, we would go on road trips in my work, we would be all piled into a minivan, and we would read through the classics, your Huckleberry Finn, your Treasure Island, the whole Laura Ingalls Wilder series, that's when they were kids, and we would read through all of those, we would read Dickens, we would read things like that, and so uh, we had a foundation of faith, love for the written word, but then that interplay that really set the foundation for us to be able to kind of push back and forth on each other's chapters and to a point where hopefully because of that interplay and because of that pushing back and because of that not being afraid to say, hey, this really isn't making it. I think you should do it completely different or let me take a stab at this sentence because obviously you're struggling or I'm struggling. Would you take a stab at that? One of the things Aaron doesn't like is when I just say, well, I'll just send you something and you'll fix it. You kind of got an, you kind of got a glimpse of that in his recent answer there. But at any rate, our final goal in building on that foundation is that I really do agree with Aaron that it is definitely a partnership. And when we get to the end of a chapter, one of our goals is that you would not know which one of us had written it because there's so much of both of us in every single chapter of every book and every short story. So it seems to me as if cohesion is very important to your partnership working with each other. 
Now, my question goes to Aaron here, because you mentioned you like to see the bigger picture and you notice how your dad has greater strengths than some of the meticulousness of character interaction, having that ability to create dynamic characters that are multifaceted and three-dimensional. I think one of the curses of current sci-fi is it's nihilistic, is such to where it's very depressing. I like science fiction that has a little bit of hope in it, just a small amount. (laughs) Can we get a little small amount? I particularly like science fiction that is provocative in thought and it's not trying to sermonize you because science fiction, if you look at the old greats, one of the greats that I love is Jack Williams and I think it's Jason Williams because he married Leah, Leah Brackett. And back in the day, science fiction was about the adventure. It was about man's ability to conquer the universe because man does have a conquering spirit. And to suppress that conquering spirit is to suppress the very reason why God gave us creativity and curiosity. In relation to your writing, what do you want readers who pick up your books to gain just from the overall message of what you're trying to say? Boy, that's a tremendous question and a big one. And I know you addressed it to me, but I'll certainly tap my dad in at at any point. Um, First of all, you mentioned uh, maybe the more uh, current inclination of sci-fi to be nihilistic. And I could understand if readers picked up Flight of the Angels and initially had that impression. It's bleak. uh, It's dark. And part of the reason is because it takes its inspiration from uh, the early church and the struggles that the early church had in terms of this burgeoning faith and trying to um, see this faith develop and grow and expand uh, in the face of uh, existential threats. And that's the conditions that we find in Flight of the Angels. Once again, Christianity is under an existential threat and these characters, uh, those uh, that have faith, are feeling hunted and hounded and doing whatever they can uh, to try to not only survive, but still find this faith that they cherish, see it uh, continue to to grow. Um, and for that reason, I do believe there are elements of, of hope um, in, in Flight of the Angels, but it doesn't come without testing and consequence. We have characters go through incredibly difficult things, things that even shake them and cause them to question their own faith. And I won't exactly answer how that gets resolved, but but I would say that a reader should feel challenged by reading Flight of the Angels, but also would, I would hope, leave the experience uh, knowing that uh, God is faithful and uh, he, he will see you through. And, and, I w- and I will tap in just everything that Aaron just said there. The other thing that we want people to get out of reading Flight of the Angels, and Aaron touched on this, but the fact that our lead characters are very imperfect, flawed, individuals they have some of the same hang-ups in their universe in their time frame that we have now they will they will respond inappropriately they will they will not be perfect and we want our readers to see that okay i can relate to this person and somehow they are muddling through and again there is that hope at the end uh the other thing that we really didn't touch on and i I appreciate this about about the series is that hopefully there's just enough touches of humor in the midst of that imperfection that we want people to be able to laugh once in a while too because that really does serve to break up that nihilism and again we I don't think we'd be doing this series if we had no hope there is hope and 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 hopefully we will bring that to an expected end Humor is one of the most understated references of God's personality that we forget to include. I love when I can laugh, and I love when the laughter comes at an unexpected moment, when you have something terrible going on or there is bleakness, and then a banana peel comes and someone slips on a banana peel. It just breaks that tension And I love when humor is involved. And so, dear listener, you can tell that Flight of the Angels is a book that is a parallel, I'll say a parallel, but not quite, of the early church. I used the term Nero cult as I was expressing this to Alan and Aaron, because during the early church, especially during the first century, you're talking about a psycho 
in charge, okay, he was burning Christians, lighting them up on fire, throwing them into a pit, not because they were doing something strange. They weren't outside sacrificing children like it's happening right now. They weren't outside tearing down capital buildings and destroying property. They were saying there is only one God. That's what they were saying. And for the Roman Empire, you have to understand this, the Romans wanted to control your thought. They were pushing against this neuro cult and they were pushing against this overwhelming public obedience and submission. And I know I sound like a right winger anarchist right now, but it's not that. It's just that you can see the parallels of the ancient world to the parallels of our time in a more crowded world, if you will. And I think storytelling is meant to reflect real life. Sci-fi has a unique opportunity to explore these themes in depth, and you can either take it as a story, face value, or you can dig in deeper, and I love to dig in deeper. Now, I was telling you, dear listener, that Alan, Aaron, and I have been working on a wonderful project that just released and it is called what, Aaron? A Time for Everything, uh, a short story collection, I should say. We were trying to figure out if it was sci-fi or if it was fantasy. And so we just decided on a speculative fiction anthology inspired by Ecclesiastes 3. Aaron, tell our listeners about this anthology and why we were so excited to be a part of it. Yes, as you said, inspired by uh, Ecclesiastes 3, which is that very famous passage, a time to be born, a time to die, etc. And so um, there are a number of uh, authors working in speculative fiction that were reached out to contribute a short story uh, for this. You uh, took on the challenge of being the first, a time to be born, and contributed a short story yourself. And uh, my dad and I were tasked with the time to search. And uh, Dad, I know you received that initial inquiry, so maybe I'll let you take it from there. Yeah, it was just the uh, the editor compiler of the series, Ben Avery, reached out to you know several of us, and I have to say right up front, it it was very humbling for Aaron and I to be included in what I considered to be a who's who of Christian authors here. And you know, Parker probably won't say this, but Ben said it when he released the book that he considered Parker for that first story to be a tremendous get meaning he was very very happy that you said yes parker and and of course it 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 starts off the series it starts off the anthology extremely well it's the only besides our own story which i read more times than i ever want to uh i i, I was able to read parker's story that's the only one i've read so far because the anthology has only been out for a couple of days but uh just absolutely loved it but ben reached out and had authors picking one of them and i did what i normally do which is say hey that's a really cool idea and then i was distracted by shiny objects and squirrels and didn't get back and next thing i knew they were all kind of picked up on well what ended up happening is right when i was ready to say yes to ben again uh I, I had gone through a little transition in my life and not to say too much of the story but during that transition i thought oh if only i'd done this a little bit differently than i did uh, things might have turned out maybe better for me. And that became the basis of that search in a time for search. So I scrawled out my usual pablum on the on the word processor and did what we always do, which is then I sent it to Aaron and uh, he uh, came back, rewrote a few passages, pushed back on a couple things, a lot having to do with plot pacing. Oh, a sense of place. Aaron always insists that wherever we're writing, there's a sense of place. We need to know what the smells, the feel, the, the colors, things like that are. So pushed back on a lot of that description. And once again, by the time we ended up sending the final draft to Ben, I, I feel like it looked like a story that you can't tell which one of us wrote. It's just one of our stories, and we're just thrilled to be involved in that anthology. And again, I think it would be a mistake for me to start listing all the authors. Maybe it'll be in the show notes or something because I know I'd forget somebody. But again, if you want a real who's who of Christian speculative, you know, be it romance, historical fiction, uh, sci-fi, fantasy, if you want a real who's who, this is a great anthology. It's big. 29 authors, 28 stories. It's a big one, but it's worth reading. 
I think you put the thumbtack where I wanted you to put it at because it's a big anthology. And when Ben Avery of Onward and Upward Media, dear listener, when he invited us all there, we were all probably thinking the same thing. And that was, why didn't we think of this idea before? Mm -hmm. It makes so much sense. And dear listener, if you've been following us for a long time, I was a part of another anthology where we did a speculative fiction edge to the Beatitudes by my good friend Travis Perry with Bear Publications. Now, I do have to ask you guys a question. I would love each of your opinions. So Aaron, you can go first and then Allie, you can take up where he leaves off. Do you think mainstream Christian publishing shies away from the use of speculative fiction as a vehicle for storytelling? Boy, isn't that a loaded question? Um, <laughs> I, I would say historically that sure seems to be the case. Um, but I, I am hopeful uh, that the tide is that the tide is turning, and I think uh, the reason for that uh, is multifaceted. One, uh, I believe that uh, there is more of it being produced, uh, and I also believe that at a higher quality, uh, maybe than in in years past, and. Um, I'm hopeful that we'll start to see some um, projects break through. Um, I'm sure many listeners are familiar with The Chosen. Uh, Angel Studios behind The Chosen just recently uh, released a film called The Shift that seems to be doing uh, well, uh, reasonably well at the box office, and that seems to be uh, uh, an indication of, of uh, sci-fi, uh, speculative Christian media breaking through to a degree. Now, all that to say, that's still um, you know a Christian studio producing it. So is there... Uh, opportunity for even you know other other sources to um, take and promote and and publish uh, this sort of media. I I'm certainly hopeful. And I would agree with what Aaron is saying there that I think that the quality definitely is has improved, and so therefore I think maybe that the standard houses, the publishing houses, maybe will not shy away. I think things. Movies like The Shift from Angel Studios are breakthrough movies. They will show that there is a market for it. The Venn diagram of Christians and speculative uh, uh, fiction fans, maybe those two circles overlap a little bit more than we've been led to believe in the past, and there's a real market there. And we are smack dab, all of us, in the middle of that market. So, I yes, I do think that it has been shied away from in the past, maybe because of market forces, but I do believe that's changing. And more importantly than that, I believe it's changing because there's a conversation that needs to be had, and science fiction in particular has always been been there to ask those tough questions about the human condition and engage us in a dialogue. And I think that Christians have a place at that table. I think we have a place at the head of that table, thanks to the king that we serve. And so therefore, I, I really do think that we need to be engaged in those tough questions of humanity, more so maybe than at any other point in our history. And so that's why I think this might be a breakthrough time for speculative Christian fiction, Christian sci-fi, all of the all of the elements that are kind of been looped into that one conversation. I think the time is now, and I think that that's what we're all here for, and that's what we're called to be writing for. And it brings me back to Flight of the Angels, because Flight of the Angels is using science fiction to tell a story entertain the reader as well as bring about a message in subtlety without being so overt like some things in the past with Christian fiction have been. And I'll be honest, I have not yet seen The Chosen. I have been told it's very good, but I have been burned by Christian media before. I have rolled my eyes into the back of my head until I saw blood because how boring some Christian fiction and Christian media is. When I tried to watch Cats that came out a couple of years ago, I watched 10 minutes and I decided my life was worth living and I am not going to watch this movie any longer. And so for me, just because you have the word Christian on it, you just don't accept poor quality as if we're giving Cain's offering to the Lord, if I could use that analogy. So with Flight of the Angels, you have a dystopian society where all expression of religion is being suppressed. You can't help but see the parallels now that we are fighting against. 
Let's talk about a couple of the characters in Flight of the Angels, just so our listeners can get a taste of what to expect when they pick up this book. And let me tell you, dear listener, this is two books so far. Tell us about the characters and who we're going to be following in this story. Sure. Uh, I'll, I'll jump in. First of all, you're right on in noting that um, there are certainly seem to be parallels in Flight of the Angels to the condition Christianity and, and religion maybe as, as a whole finds itself in currently. I'll, I'll be honest, when I was getting some of the initial drafts maybe in the mid-2000, like 2006, 7, 8 from my dad, I part of me thought, well, this is maybe just kind of conspiratorial, the thought that there would be things like re-education camps for not believing the right things, the fact that people of faith could be to that degree persecuted and eventually hunted down. And <laughs> day by day, it, it seems less uh, outlandish and less uh, out there far off in the future and more conditions that, that we might find ourselves grappling with sooner rather than later. So uh, once again, my, my dad, older, wiser, saw <laughs> saw things that I, I only came around uh, eventually to seeing myself. Um, but some of the characters that are, are wrestling with those conditions, it starts uh, with Dex DeFalco. He is a uh, former captain in the Navy who had to make a decision to save a colony that was under assault from these forces that are looking to uh, not only suppress but hunt down Christians. He and his squad mates uh, made a decision to uh, put their careers on the line and rescue this defenseless colony and try to find a way to relocate and support and defend them in the midst of these hostile conditions. Uh, Dex himself, though, as he's seen defeat after defeat and struggle after struggle himself, is now starting to question his own faith. It cost him everything, but is it worth it? Yep. And then uh, in a kind of a unique way of writing, we have a parallel storyline with the other, what we would consider the lead character, and that would be uh, uh, Derek Mason. He is an up and coming junior executive in this probably one of the largest corporations in the United Coalition, which is kind of our, our uh, form of government. It's the society at the time of this writing. And Dex or uh, Derek is up and coming in this corporation. But of course, he also is putting up with all of the corporate garbage, the put down, the political maneuvering, just trying to make a way for himself. He obviously also has an appetite for some of the finer things in life. So therefore, his expenses, he's, you know, for lack of a better way of putting it, he's drowning in debt and just always sure that the next promotion will help. But the problem is things in his department keep going wrong this launches Derek into an investigation as because it seems to be beyond his control no matter what he does this launches him into an investigation of what's going on in his department and this investigation even puts him kind of at odds with the own company that he works for but yet he's discovering more and more dark truths about what is going on so there's real elements of corporate espionage along with this with the space fantasy or space opera side with the angels and the squadron and everything you also have a real corporate espionage piece with Derek's timeline and so he finds out some of these really dark secrets secrets and their their timelines just go on and on and on and you know will they eventually intersect well there's a lot of lives that are hanging in the balance of what uh, Dex is fighting for and what Derek begins to discover one of the fascinating things about your story and you alluded to this earlier was the grittiness of the story because you're not in a kumbaya let's hold hands and just be safe people will die for their beliefs and I want to let that just sit there. People will die for their beliefs. I like stories that challenge me in my faith because I wonder, would I be the one to stand up firm before the Lord or will I be a collaborator? So these are the kind of questions I think Christians should ask themselves because we're in a post-Christian society. What I like about this too is that there's book two and book two is called A Nest, uh, um, nest of Hornets, correct? Hornet's oh. Nest. Oh, so, sorry, Hornet's Nest. Mm -hmm. And how does this, without giving any spoilers, because you're going to be back for that book too, what can readers expect? Will it be a direct sequel to book one? Is it going to take on 
new dimensions with new characters are the characters from the first book coming into the second book what's going on well for the first thing i'll say is this i appreciate what you said about people wondering how they would hold up to being in a situation where they had to answer for their faith or face consequences, even life and death. I, I think that's a universal, uh, uh, I think you, that's universally something that Christians uh, think about and consider, especially as you noted, uh, the direction that that a lot of uh, this seems to be headed and not <laughs> be headed. That was... Uh, <laughs> See what I did there? I used to be headed. <laughs> yeah, you saw what I did there. Right, yeah. But um, that, that, that's, that's truly how the book begins and I think some of the central wrestling that that the characters have throughout the book it it culminates uh there there is at a climactic moment in flight of the angels a character is confronted with exactly uh that decision and of course I won't spoil how that goes but that very I would say primal question that Christians uh consider is is truly at the heart of flight of the angels um you asked about hornet's nest um it picks up essentially immediately uh, where Flight of the Angels uh, leaves off. I would say there is a definitive conclusion to Flight of the Angels, but there are certainly some unresolved elements, some some threads. I, I won't go so far as to call it a cliffhanger, but it will certainly leave you wanting more in terms of wondering what happened uh, to some of the characters that, that would have been left in some precarious situations. So book two does pick up uh, essentially right after where book one leaves, and uh, helps to resolve some of those lingering questions, but also then goes on to demonstrate that this threat to this colony that's been protected, uh, this threat to the squadron that are called the angels uh, because they trace their roots uh, in the universe back to the blue angels. So that's kind of the connective tissue why the book is called Flight of the Angels. There are threats uh, to this squadron and there are uh, things even more nefarious happening than maybe the characters realized in, in book one. Absolutely. It, 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 it's, it's a common idea that in a second installment of, let's just say that there are three books that will really tie everything together. And yes, we are working on, on the third novel right now. If, if, there are, if, if, if three is going to really, really tie up all the story, uh, the second installment, the second act, if you will, is usually darker and things definitely get more difficult uh, things get, the existential threat is more present. It's more right there. Some of the struggles the characters go through take on as much a physical, as much as a spiritual and emotional toll. And it's, it, it, it gets, again, with all that hope we talked about earlier, woven in still the humor and everything, the darkness is still there and they're still fighting that darkness. Yeah, Hornet's Nest is uh, kind of a, a dual title, just like Flight of the Angels, where the squadron is called the Angels, but also Angels having that that spiritual component to it. Hornet's Nest similarly has a dual component where the the fighters that uh, the squadron flies are called Hornets again, uh, tracing back to our, our current time uh, with the with the Navy connection. But uh, the thought too is that their lives have become a Hornet's Nest, just. Uh, in chaos and disarray and being attacked on all sides and how are they finding a way to navigate through that well dear listener you can tell that flight of the angels the series is one you're going to want to sink your teeth into so what i want you to do like i told you at the beginning of this broadcast is go ahead love on my brothers today and get your copy of flight of the angels books one and two Flight of the angels is book one hornet's nest is book two and you also have an opportunity to get a short story in this universe called Blood Ace. It's only 99 cents. Go ahead, pick up your copy of all three today. Then stay tuned because there's going to be a book three. And I know you're going to want to finish this entire series. And we will be showcasing it on the right stuff in future episodes. Lastly, before I let you both go, this show is always about encouraging the aspiring author out there whom God has given the gift to write, to pick up the pen and do so. So go ahead, either dad or son or both of you, encourage that author out there today. I would, I would say yes, absolutely. We, we've got stories inside of us. You young author, new author, even old author like me, you've got a story inside of you. God has put that in you. Just begin. One of the things you have to do in order to write is simply write. Don't 
strive for perfection. Always strive for excellence, but don't strive for perfection because that'll paralyze you. Go for the best, most excellent storytelling you can. Make sure that while you are writing, you're also reading some of the great, great uh, books that were written of old, Dante's Divine Comedy, Homer's uh, Iliad, and Od the Odyssey. You know, I mean, just read through, keep your craft sharp, but keep writing, and then get a group of critical friends around you who you don't mind. You don't have an ego in this. You just want to produce the best story that you can so they can tell you this worked this didn't. And then that will cause you to hone your craft even further. And I just want to encourage everybody out there. Just if you've got a story in you, start writing, start writing it. Even, write the story you want to read and you'll do just fine. Yeah. I, that's, that's wonderfully said. I, I would echo that. We are made in the image of God. We are image bearers. He is a God who creates. And I believe that part of being image bearers is that we are meant to create and produce. And regardless if someone is wildly successful and selling millions of copies, or it's read by just a handful of people, I think there is intrinsic value to creating something and doing it as unto the Lord, to the best of your ability. And uh, I think uh, whoever out there is just fine to do so will feel, I would hope, uh, intrinsic uh, worth of value just uh, purely uh, from that profit. Thank you both so much for being with me on the show today. Dear listener, if you want to get in contact with them, simply go to flightoftheangels.com. Again, flightoftheangels.com. You can find out what they're doing and more by visiting their website. Go ahead, check it out today. Alan and Aaron, thank you so much for being a part of this show. And I cannot wait to have you back and have you back real soon. Thank you, Parker. Yep, absolute pleasure. And we were talking today to Alan and Aaron Rainey. They are the author of the book, Flight of the Angels, which is book one of the Flight of the Angels series, available on Amazon.com or wherever books are sold. Were you invigorated by this conversation, dear listener? Do you have that world inside of you that is itching to come out? Do you want to build stories that you can share your message that God has given you to write about? What are you waiting for? Go ahead, pick up the pen and write stuff. Thank you so much for joining me for this edition of The Right Stuff. I'm the Queen Parker J, and you have a wonderful, absolutely glorious, Blessed day.